Everybody talk loud. Talk loud. Oh, you betcha. You betcha. Ding, Chicken. Good job. Chicken. Okie dokie. As, as we start out here, I'm going to give you a little uh, sermon outline. We can get to up here. Can we use these as one of our six sermons that we're doing? <laughs> Not this one. Not this one. Not this one. But we are going to talk about sermon outlining and, and give you a hint or two about this. I call this one Let Marriage Be Honored. And this is this is the uh, scripture that I start out with. And marriage is busy these days. But here's my first point. God provided a divine plan for marriage. And when you when you give your points in a sermon, your points ought to be linguistically connected to each other so that the person uh, gets the point all the way down through. The first point under this, we're gonna we're gonna look at the scripture that gives the plan, and then we're gonna say God's plan involves leaving. This is from Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cling to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So the outline form, see, we talked about God's plan. God provided a plan for marriage. A, under that, God's plan involves leaving. You're consistent in the wording. B, God's plan involves clinging to each other. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, but cling to his wife, and these two shall be one flesh. And C, God's plan involves becoming one flesh. But in each of these subpoints, we're talking about God's plan. See, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And of course, I develop each one of these points. Then the second major point of the outline is man corrupted and changed God's plan. And you see, I'm still working off of that central theme of God's plan for marriage. God provided the plan. His plan involved leaving and clinging and becoming one flesh. Man changed and corrupted God's plan. And then the subpoints under that, he corrupted God's plan through polygamy. There's a nice Mormon family from Utah with two wives. <laughs> See? God, uh, man corrupted God's plan through polygamy. That's point A. But notice how we've still got God's plan in there. And uh, what's that? I couldn't read it. Can, can you read it? it? I can read it now. Okay. He corrupted God's plan through polygamy. And the second point under that, B, is he corrupted God's plan through divorce. But see, what, what words are keeping the theme together all the way through? God's plan. God's plan, see? And so, uh, the man corrupted God's plan through divorce. Then point three is, Jesus restored God's plan for marriage. See, God provided the plan, and man corrupted the plan. And Jesus restored God's plan for marriage. And I'm going to use these scriptures right here that Jesus used. Matthew 19, 6, though they are no longer two but one, and what God joined together, let not man separate. And then I'm going to use this one here. But he didn't let them divorce anymore and remarry. He told them that you're supposed to stick with the one you got. Then the final point is, and I didn't have any subpoints under number three, so I, I might have to develop that a little bit more. Final point is, God's people must support God's plan for marriage. God's people must support God's plan. For marriage. And A, under that, we support God's plan through biblical love. And I'm going to talk about how biblical love holds marriages together. And uh, B, we support God's plan through mutual submission. Hey, what was the, 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 
We support God's plan through biblical love that commands husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I'm going to make the point that that was, that's not a feeling, but that's a commitment that we make, no matter what, you know. And that keeps marriages together. And B, we support God's plan through mutual submission. I'm coming out of Ephesians 5.21 where it says, Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. We support God's plan through mutual submission. That's where we put our husband or wife's needs before our own. What verse was that that you gave? Ephesians 5.21. And then see, we support God's plan through understanding. And the scripture is 1 Peter 3.7. Live with your wives in an understanding way. And then number um, up, that should be D instead of C there. Found my own mistake. Ephesians 4, 5, 4, 5, 7. 1 Peter 3, 7 was the last one. And then the D is we support God's plan through mutual encouragement. So if we look at the skeletons or the bones of the sermon outline, it goes like this. God provided a plan, that's point one. Man corrupted or changed the plan, that's point two. Jesus uh, restored the plan, that's point three. And point four is God's people support the plan, must support the plan. So the thing that holds your sermon together is that God has a plan for marriage. And that's the thing we need to stick to, is God's plan. But the fact that your points are worded in such a way, that that theme keeps coming out in every point, that helps keep the thinking of the church right with you all the way through, see? And if you were going to provide a conclusion to this, it is that, you know, you need, we, need to, we need to be involved in God's plan. We don't need to depart from God's plan. Our lives need to support that plan. He doesn't have any other plan than that plan. You know, and uh, that's how we can honor marriage is by uh, supporting God's plan. But the way that you outline stuff makes all the difference in the world as to how plainly you can communicate things. It's sort of like that outline I gave you in Philippians, be of the same mind. See, you talk about the importance of your attitude and your mind and how that affects everything you do and say, okay... Be of the same mind as Paul and give the example. Be of the same mind as Christ. Be of the same mind as uh, Timothy. Be of the same mind as Epaphroditus. And the fact that every point has that same phraseology in it, it ends up driving home the main idea of your sermon, see, and that is that we're to have this attitude, this mindset that was in all those people. Uh, many people preach like uh, shotgun folks. They, they decide to get a sermon together and they say, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I talked about this over here and this over here and this over here and this over here? And it's sort of like shooting a shotgun in the air and scattering pellets everywhere. When I, when I first learned to uh, hunt ducks, I used to go out and a flock of ducks would jump up somewhere up there in Wyoming and I'd just pull up my little 20 gauge and blast away and I didn't hit any ducks. And I didn't, I, I couldn't believe I missed the ducks and and there was a big flock of ducks, and I didn't kill a duck. And somebody finally told me, look, you can't just raise up a blast. You've got to pick out one duck out of that thing, and you've got to put the bead of that shotgun right in front of that one duck's nose, and then pull the trigger while you're moving with him, and then you're going to kill that duck. So I said, huh, you think so? And I started trying to get one duck, and sure enough, I killed some ducks. See? So one of the problems is with preaching, with preachers, is we don't pick out one duck that we want to shoot in a sermon and shoot that particular duck, see? And that's what makes a good sermon. When everybody in the whole room knows what duck you picked out and what duck you shot, and they know that that's exactly the duck you killed, you see? And they all know exactly what the sermon is about. And that happens when you stay on one point and you drive that one point home through the whole sermon, whatever that is. 
Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Dan, but um, sometimes it seems like uh, in sermons we want to be exegetical and everything, and, and but to really bring a point home, we need to go to different passages. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the, the appropriateness of that in, in front of a, a congregation. Well, of, of course that's all right to do, um, but if you, if you preach an exegetical sermon, like for example, um, you could use the passage we just used in Philippians where Paul says twice, I press on, and, and you could use your sermon title, I press on. Uh, and then you could have two points under that. Uh, we, we cannot press on unless we forget the things that lie behind. That's point number one. Point number two, we, we cannot press on unless we move ahead to the things that are stretched forward to the things that lie ahead. And in conclusion, we must press on. And you can talk about how we can't live a positive Christian life unless we press on. And your wording can be real consistent, and yet it can be exegetical. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so one doesn't exclude the other. Now, sometimes you just preach a general topical sermon, like what I've done here, and you, you, you make it consistent by your wording. But, and that's fine, as long as everything you're saying is not taken out of context and stuff. But uh, I'm trying to do something different in these classes. I'm trying to teach you to think exegetically to start out with and uh, teach you how to preach exegetical sermons. I preach topical sermons. But I also make sure that the scriptures I'm using in those topical sermons are not taken out of context. That's because I've done my exegetical work usually before I do that. Anybody else want to ask a question about sermons or outlines or anything like that? Okay. Very good. Did I did I give you the one that I did last week on on resurrection testimony or not? No. You should do that. Yeah, let me let me show you that one real quick. And it'll show you a similar principle. Let's see, P Q R S T, okay. Okay, the title of the sermon was Resurrection Testimony. And we started out with the idea of testimony, and I asked them, you know. Would you believe it if your grandmother told you a story, if it was true, if, uh, if one of your friends came up and, and uh, told you an eyewitness account of something, would you believe them? If your three-year-old came up and told you something, would you believe what your three-year-old said? You know, I gave them several different examples of different kinds of testimony. And then I talked about how Peter said, this Jesus that God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. See, we haven't got to point one yet. This is just the introduction about testimony. And uh, we talked about um, Paul testifying or witnessing to the resurrection. And we talked about uh, John testifying or witnessing to the resurrection. Then we, we started naming off witnesses. Number one, the witness of the women. Witness and testimony, same word. Witness of the women. Mary Magdalene and Salome and Mary, the mother of Jesus, said we found an empty tomb and angels, and they told us he wasn't there. Point two, the witness of Peter and John. See, my key word is witness, testimony. Somebody who's, who says they saw something. See? The witness of Peter and John, who ran to the tomb and found it empty, and they found the grave clothes lying there, and they saw and believed because of what they saw. Number three, I just want you to get the idea about the consistent wording. See, the witness of Mary Magdalene. She said she was crying and trying to find his body and thought he was the gardener, and then she realized it was him and clung to him, and she came back and said, I have seen the Lord. That was her testimony. 
Number four, the witness of Thomas Didymus. He wasn't there when Jesus came. He said, I'll never believe unless I see and unless I put my hands in the wounds. And so when he did, he said, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But see, the only way we could believe without seeing is by way of testimony, right? Witness that comes from somebody. Then you had the witness of the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Those guys that were walking along the road and Jesus started walking with them and talking with them and explaining the scriptures. And they finally realized that he was the risen Lord. So they had their testimony put in there. Then you had the witness of the fishermen in John 21 when Jesus appeared to them by the Sea of Galilee. And they ate breakfast with him, and he challenged them to be disciples, preach his word, the witness of the fishermen. Then you had the witness of the 500. Just write down fishermen, and you can fill in the blank. Then you got the witness of the 500. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says, Then he appeared to above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. So that's 500 people that saw and testified to the resurrection. Then you had the witness of James. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Then he appeared to James. James is James the Lord's brother that didn't believe on Jesus during his lifetime. But when the risen Lord appeared to him, he became a believer. He became the great leader of the Jerusalem church, and he even wrote the book of James, the testimony of James. Then you've got the witness of Matthias. Matthias was that one that they chose to replace who? Judas. Judas. And they said, of the men that accompanied with us all the time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up, must one of these become a witness with us of his resurrection? So that Matthias went around telling people he'd seen Jesus after he raised from the dead. Then there was the witness of Saul of Tarsus. This was point number 10 in his term. Witness of Saul of Tarsus who saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, told everybody he could think of about it. Changed his life. Then finally there was the witness of John on the island of Patmos. When he said, I heard this big voice speaking to me, and I turned around and looked, and I saw one like a son of man. Got in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12 and following. The witness of John on the island of Patmos. So I figured that what word did I use over and over and over and over again in this sermon? Witness, Witness. Uh, testimony. Witness or testimony. So my conclusion was, look at all that testimony and how diverse it is, and how many different people it is, and how many different places it comes from. Isn't that pretty convincing that, that we ought to believe that Jesus really is the risen Lord of heaven and earth? See, that was my sermon. But the word that tied all that together was witness or testimony. Shows you how when you're communicating something, you keep hitting that nail and hammering that one nail over and over and over and over again. And then your people say, I know what this sermon was about. It was about all the witnesses to the resurrection. What's the one word they remembered out of that sermon? Witness. See? And they remember that there were all these witnesses of the resurrection, but the word helped them remember. And uh, the consistency of the outlining on the sermon. This is what I was talking about the other day when I said, you probably forgot it because your mind was on other things, but I said your job as a preacher is to study and know the truth, then to organize your thoughts. That's what we're talking about here with outlining, organizing your thoughts, and then to stand and deliver that truth in a powerful and organized way so that people will get it. So you know the truth, you organize it, and then you present it, you preach it, you teach it to people in an organized fashion. And that helps them get it. What one duck did I hit here in this sermon? Witness. Witness. That's exactly right. 
It, it killed him. It killed him dead. I plucked him. <laughs> I gutted him, plucked him, cooked him, and ate him. Fitness of the resurrection. Okay. John? Yes. But the conclusion here is not uh, clear. What's that? You can see the, the outline, but the conclusion. Yes, you're exactly right, Brother Roger. I did not make a slide for my conclusion. I just did it verbally. But what I did in the conclusion, what your conclusion would look like is, you would just review and say, consider all these witnesses. And I did this in my sermon. I said, think of the power of the testimony of, of the three women and of Mary Magdalene and of Peter and John and of, of the two on the road to Emmaus and of, I kind of named them all off again, you know, and just said, how powerful is that, you know, and, and I concluded by just telling them what I told them. Does that make sense, Brother Roger? Yes, sir. So if you were to make another slide, your conclusion would read, uh, the testimony of all of these witnesses is overwhelming, or something like that, and that Jesus is risen from the dead. But you're right, a sermon needs a conclusion, where you kind of Wrap it all up and tell them what you told them. If you make that real simple, you tell them what you're going to tell them. That's one. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. That's it. Right there. Understand? How should we start preaching with the, with the PowerPoint? Like, where do you get those... Well, you don't have to preach with the PowerPoint, but Mike Tights is trying to teach you how to do it. You get all these pictures off the Internet by, by going to Google and doing Google image searches and things like that. But um, that's not the point. You could preach that with or without the PowerPoint by just telling the story about those things. You know, PowerPoint is just a good visual aid that helps people stay on point with you. If I, when I used to do this, when I had an old slate blackboard, I would just take my chalk and I'd write on the blackboard, number one, the witness of so-and-so, and I'd preach on that a while. And then I'd chalk up on the blackboard, number two, the witness of so-and-so, and I'd preach on that, and number three, and I'd just do exactly the same thing with an old blackboard. You can do it any way you want to. Yes, Brother Kurt Perry. Um, yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes people will say, "Well, those were people that followed Jesus and so forth." And and uh, and just brought to mind a question since we're you you brought up the topic. Uh -huh. Do we have any? Do we have any uh, documentation of people who claimed uh, that you know that could be documented of that time period who claimed to have met um, Jesus and said that he didn't raise? Because um, I, I don't, I've never even heard that, and I'm just kind of curious. Because to me, that would be a powerful argument that he, that you know, that nobody even really denied that. You know um, what I'm no, even in the scripture, you have the Romans who tried to uh, promote the idea that his body was stolen. You know. Yes. But of course, um, the evidence is. Uh, from the New Testament, when they saw Jesus of Nazareth and they said that uh, they saw his tomb and they saw the grave clothes that were taken off the body and the napkin that was folded up. And, you know, if they were grave robbers, then why did they do that, etc.? Uh, let me give you a little something on that here. This is a, another lesson about what you ask. Is the Jesus story a true story? You know, you have all that biblical testimony. But you also have the testimony of Tacitus, who was a Roman historian. In this section, in the, in the Latin Roman historian Tacitus, he said the founder of, of Christianity was Christus, or Christ, who underwent the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Well, that's exactly what the Bible says. You know, and this guy was not a Christian. He was a pagan, had nothing to do with the Bible. Then, uh, this is, I think, Josephus's quote about Pilate and his crucifixion of uh, 
Jesus. Josephus mentions like 22 guys by the name of Jesus. But in the list of 22 different ones, he mentions Jesus who is called the Christ. And Josephus was a Jew. He was not a Christian. Those are all different Jesuses. And then you've got Josephus' statement about Jesus, about the surprising deeds and miracles that he did and all that kind of stuff and how that he was called the Messiah. And Josephus is a Jew, not, not having anything to do with the Bible. And talks about how that his followers are still around. And yeah, well, then, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Then you've got the fact that when the Bible presents this story, it presents it in, in a real setting with real people of the time, and it mentions their names and all of these different people's names we can find in Roman records and other records that show they really were real people instead of fictitious characters, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, give an example here of one of them, Pontius Pilate, and how we know who he was and when he came to be procurator and who was before him and who was after him and who sent him and who deposed him. And all of this goes straight along with the Bible story. And how we know that the Gospels are actually first century documents that come from the exact time they say they come from. And that these are all sources that are uh, confirming the story of Jesus, both Christian and non-Christian sources. That, have, that are outside of the Bible. It's not just the Bible. These are all outside of the Bible. And then we talk about, you know, the claims of the Gospels. And some people would say that the historical Jesus, that is the, the real Jesus that lived, is different than the Jesus we believe in, in the Bible. But those people don't believe the testimony of the Gospels. And uh, A.J. Rawlinson asks a good question. He says, if it was Christianity that created the figure of Christ in the Gospels, what was it that created Christianity? I think that's a pretty good question. That's good. See, that is a very good question. See, the only, only way that there's Christianity is because Christ was who he said he was. And all those people really believed it. And all those 500 people saw what they saw and told everybody else about it and Saul of Tarsus changed from being the greatest enemy to the greatest proponent of Christianity, and all this evidence was overwhelming to the people. Uh, so there's all kinds of other uh, questions you can ask. Why did James become a Christian when he never believed on Jesus during his life? You know, Why did Paul turn to Christianity? All the councils. <laughs> Why did it become a movement for the whole world? Were people just stupid or what, you know? <laughs> what caused it to persist for 300 years of persecution? They didn't, they didn't uh, do it militarily like the Islamic people that did it at the point of a sword. In fact, they were persecuted and killed and everything else. Why did it persist? Well, it must be because people really believed it. And that's the, that's the answer. And Paul gives why he believed. So this is, uh, this is the point I end with in this, that the ancient Christians literally believed the extraordinary story of Jesus as factuals. They must have had a really good reason to believe it. I guess my, my question is, um, I, I w my question would be to an atheist or whoever is, um, and I'm wondering if this is a true statement, that there we have no verifiable um, evidence of people who said that they have met Jesus and then and then denied um, um, that he did come from the dead, like from that specific time period. Would that be a true statement, you think, or no? No, because the Roman soldiers and the Roman governor and everything perpetuated the a story that he was stolen in the book of Matthew. They did that because they didn't want anything getting started, you know, by the Christians. And then they proceeded to try to stamp out Christianity, but it didn't work. So, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? Okay. Let's get 
Well, there was all kinds of stuff we could talk about there, but I was just trying to show you some outlines, and I was going to answer your question if I could. Now, what's this supposed to be a class on? Philippians. <laughs> oh, Philippians, yeah. Yeah, you are being unselfish. No problem. <laughs> you actually chase your rabbit. Yeah, I chased a rabbit, but it won't happen very often. All right. But it was a rabbit I thought that might help you be better preachers. <laughs> okay. So Paul brings this down to a conclusion in chapter 4, and he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And, of course, the, the key thing here is in the Lord. And then he urges Yodia and Syntyche to live in harmony or be of the same mind in the Lord. And I would encourage you, as you study some more, and you try to nail all these down, I would encourage you to go through the book of Philippians and, and find every occurrence of this word phronane or phroneo and, and trace that word through the book because that really does help you to trace the theme of the attitude or mind uh, through the book of, of Philippians. This is where we were talking about uh, when we ended the break is whoever this true comrade was, this true yoke fellow was, he was a Christian leader that, that Paul trusted. We don't really know his name, but he wanted uh, this guy to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. The way you help them is to help them forget the things that are behind and move forward to the things that are ahead and forgive each other and to have the attitude of Christ toward each other. Uh, what are some practical ways that we can, have, we can help other people to have the attitude of Christ? How do you do that? How do you help them don't have the right attitude? Give me some idea. You were all muffled. We don't understand what you said. All right. How do you help someone to have the right uh, attitude like this guy was being asked to help these women? Roger, what would you say? You must live in a consistent way. But if someone you should okay. see it. All right, you must be unselfish yourself and show this attitude yourself. That's one way. What's another way? Rejoice. Okay, but how does that help these women? You're right, of course, but how is that, how's that going to help these women? Well, you're rejoicing in the Lord. You're, you're going to be in a good state of mind. <laughs> okay. Less likely to do. Uh, Argue and fight with others. All right. Now, but again, as a preacher, how exactly is that going to help these women? <clears throat> well, we'll be transformed into Christ um, in, the, in, <clears throat> in His attitude. Okay, but, but see, you're talking, you're exactly right, but you're talking in theory, and I'm talking about in every day what you actually do. How is oh, this going right. to help these women? That would create peace. How? Not to take sides. Um, encourage them when you're talking to one. When someone's talking negative about the other, okay. um, I guess uh, tell them that, hey, you know, point out the good things about them. And try and not take sides because that'll create more problems. All right. So in order to do that, you're going to have to actually talk to both these women, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Does it matter how these women feel about you? No. It doesn't. It does. It does. How? How so? Well, if they don't. But I guess if they don't trust what you have to say, or if they don't trust your opinions and things, then what you say doesn't really matter to them. Okay, how are they going to grow to trust what you say and trust your opinions and all that kind of stuff? I would say by what Roger was saying before, that you need to live, you know, you need to be an example of, uh, of a person who's living like Christ would live. All right, you're exactly right. Here's, here's the point I'm trying to get you guys to see. 
if you're living a good life and sister so-and-so doesn't see you, then what good is that? In other words, just the fact that you're living a good life is not enough. You've got to be exposed to her. She's got to be exposed to you. She's got to be around you. She's got to see you. She's got to be in situations where she observes you or if you're going to have any effect on her. You see what I'm saying? So, so somehow the preacher who's, who's trying to help these women or help these men is going to have to develop a rapport with those people so that those people can observe firsthand what his example and attitude is so that he can help them. If he's sitting off in his office or if he never visits them or anything and he doesn't have any exposure to them, then he can be good in all he wants to, but it's not going to affect them. Terry, do you have a comment? You're talking about two Christians, though, right? Two Christian women. You're not talking about maybe one Christian woman comes to you and says she's having a problem with someone else that you don't even know. Yeah, we're talking about two Christian women, but the same principle could work with anybody. How do you have an influence over anyone? The only way you have an influence over anyone is to spend time with that person and to have some interaction with that person so that you build rapport and respect with that person. And then when you try to encourage that person, it means something. If you haven't done that, you can talk to your blue in the face and they don't care anything about you. You're not going to change anything with them. See? Some preachers think that they're just going to show up on Sunday morning and give a lesson and that's going to influence people. That's not going to do anything to people, pretty much, unless they are uh, already disposed to do something. You're not going to help people until you get into their lives in some way. But if you and your wife, for example, have been going to visit them for weeks and weeks and weeks, and you've, you've done nice things for them, and they think a lot of you and everything, and then you talk to them about this and tell them how much you appreciate them, then maybe you're actually going to help these women. You see what I'm saying? So the attitude of Christ is not just a theory that we talk about in class. It's something that you have to put skin and bones on and you have to make it a reality in actual contact with actual people. And that's where it becomes uh, something that's meaningful. Uh, even if you're influencing another person like another preacher or a student or whatever, you can't really influence any other person unless you have a relationship of some kind a rapport with those people where you talk with them and you discuss things and they see you in different circumstances and etc. So so why was Epaphroditus such a great example for these people? Because see he was one of their own people and they knew him and they knew what kind of man he was and they respected him and therefore he would be one that could help these women. Uh, Brother Roger did you have a comment? No, sir. I'm listening. Okay. Yes, Brother Eli. Um, with Epaphroditus, whenever it uh, talks about how he was distressed, whenever, well, Epaphroditus was sick, he was distressed because he had heard that the Philippians knew that he was sick. Right. Is that, I mean, could you term that as Paul... Um, giving another example of how he wasn't concerned about himself, but he was concerned more about the Philippians. Right, and it also shows that the Philippians had a relationship with Epaphroditus. They thought a lot of this guy, and he had a rapport with them, and when they heard he was sick, they were really worried about him because he was important to them. And the fact that he was important to them gave him more influence. And Paul said, now that's the kind of guy you need to be looking at. Now you can probably think of somebody... Uh, like in the church there at Bear Valley or in your home church or whatever, just a person, just a regular person, that everybody just respects that person because they're just a good person. And everybody really looks to that person as an example of being a good person. So that's the kind of person that has rapport and respect that's going to be an influence in situations where there's a conflict because nobody would want to go against that person. It'd be like going against your good old grandmother. You'd know you were wrong if you were doing it, see? So uh, that's the kind of rapport that we need to build as preachers by being around people, and it doesn't happen overnight. 
Some preachers think they can go to a congregation in the first week that they're there. Everybody ought to listen to them, you know. Uh, this morning we were talking to Terry Harmon in the Ukraine, and he's only been in Gorlovka for since September. And he got there, and there were these two congregations there in the Ukraine, and the two congregations kind of had tension between them. And he's at this one congregation, and he's trying to establish this school. And the congregation has a preacher, and the preacher was converted from being a Jehovah's Witness to being a Christian. And they're trying, he's trying to develop a relationship with these people. So it's taken him this long, from September to now, to get his foot in the door and begin to be trusted by these people and begin to be respected by these people. And now finally he's in a position where they're asking him to teach and they're, they're respecting his work in the school and they like him and they know he's the real deal and, and they're going to they're gonna trust him more and more, see. He's getting himself in a position to be able to really help those people. But it didn't happen overnight because... People don't trust outsiders until you you earn the right to be trusted. And so whoever this guy was that says, help these women, he must have been a guy that was a real spiritual leader that both of these women would respect. And so he says, you help these women. And uh, that's what you have to do. Now, what if somebody came to you that you didn't really respect and tried to tell you what you needed to do? you wouldn't go along with would you? you'd think well, who are you to tell me what to do you're not even living the right way see so you've got to have credibility that's why Paul said in Timothy that the leaders of the church are supposed to be a pillar in support of the truth they've got to be people that the people really respect and that way they can have a good influence on those people Okay, so that's how you're going to help people. you got to get to know people. You've got to grow credibility among them. Um, anybody want to ask anything else about that? Okay, so he says, You help these people who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Together with Clement, and we don't know much about Clement, and the rest of my fellow workers who name are in the book of life. See, that's why Paul was so interested in these people, because their names were in the book of life. Anybody want to share with me some places in the scriptures I can find the book of life mentioned? Revelation. Revelation, chapter 13, verse, what is it, 7? Or 13, 8 and 17, 8, I think it is. And then Exodus, chapter 30. Three is it or thirty-two? Let's turn back there. Exodus chapter thirty-two, verse thirty-two and thirty-three. Exodus thirty-two, verses thirty-two and thirty-three. Somebody that has it, read it for me. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out from your book, which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot them out of my book. All right. So so the book that God has written, your name is in the book. But your name can be blotted out of the book. See? And uh, here he speaks of those whose names are in the book of life. And in Revelation, it speaks of those whose names are in the book of life. And in Revelation 20, verse, what is it, 14 or 15, it says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. So that's a book you want your name in, is the book of life. Now see those people that say you can never be lost after you've been saved, they might have trouble with that Exodus passage that says don't, Blot your name out of the book of life. How could you blot it out if it never had been there in the first place? See? So that might be a good scripture to, to use in a situation like that. Does anybody want to say or ask anything else? 
I'm going to let you go a minute or two before, but I'm going to pray for you before we go. Let's pray together. Lord, please bless us today and give us strength to accept your word. I pray that you'll bless every brother who is studying your word there in Denver and here. I pray that you will strengthen us to be true men of God who love you and will try to do your will. Forgive us, Father, when we fail you. Strengthen us in what's right. Help us, Lord, to do as you've said in your word and forget what lies behind and press forward to what lies ahead. Use us, Father, to spread your word to others who need you so much and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a good rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.